you know, as a child who wanted to become a superhero, I knew that as a superhero, as somebody who wanted to be a superhero, I had to constantly work and grow and become better. And you can't become better if you think you're already at the apex of where you should be. So as a human, I see myself as 100% perfectly incomplete in that I am never going to stop growing. I am never going to think that I have it fully figured out. Even my most deeply held belief, and people know me to be very opinionated about certain things, uh, especially as it relates to like kindness and compassion in the world. Like I'm very, very rigid about it, but I'm still willing to hear people. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a willingness to question yourself and your values and your beliefs about things in service of becoming the type of person you want to be. So I think I set a stake in the ground of like, I want to be a superhero, right? I want to be a person who cares for others. I want to be a person who makes others feel seen. I never want to make someone feel badly about themselves. I want to protect people who can't protect themselves. Like all of these things that like I idealize, right? Whether it's through the media I consume or whatever. And I think to do those things to get there, I know that I have to work on myself. You know, you can't be, you can't be a superhero if you make people feel uncomfortable in your presence. You can't be a superhero if you make people feel, um, you know, not just uncomfortable, but like that they don't have a voice to speak in your presence. So there's just a lot of things. I think you just have to, you have to be willing to question yourself and work on it. What is up, my dude? <laughs> What's going on, man? What's up with you, EQ gangster? What's up, man? That's right. I just yeah. spent the whole fucking morning with you. I think you're a really good dude. No way, dude. I totally appreciate that, man. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I listened to like three or four episodes. Uh, all the ones where the titles jumped out at me. Um, and it turned out that I think like three of them were all solo episodes. Okay. I really appreciated because that's like a, a tough nut to crack is doing the solo episode. Yeah. So I want to, uh, on a separate note, wanted to chat with you about how you pull that off because uh, for my podcast, Shareable, I have all different types of episodes that I do. And the solos, I, like I find to be the hardest unless I have a script because I do a solo podcast also, but like I'm reading a blog post as I do it. So like get out there and just like extemporaneously, like do your thing. I sometimes feel like I'm rambling with it. Sure, sure. I completely understand. Yeah. yeah. I, and I, I spent last night doing all, you know, reading up on you and dude, that I am, and I still want to go back through it again. I watched the um, one that I just absolutely was fire, man, is you were doing a presentation. Here it is becoming superhuman on YouTube with virtual yeah. internships. Oh, yeah. Dude, that is fire, bro. Yo, my whole thing is superheroes, bro. Like, <laughs> that's, like that's what I, well, when you when you shared your story of like, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> when you shared your story of like, and, and and again, your slides were fire, your content was fire, but like when you were saying, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I I, I like I was a superhero, like I, that was like I was Superman, right? And and, I'm, and obviously it's your story, but man, that's every kid's story right every yeah. kid was like superman or incredible hulk or you know whatever the thing is right so such such dude it was it was amazing thanks it's, man thanks yeah so it's great to meet you bro super yeah same to meet you. dude i got a book recommendation for you by the way not yeah. not just my book but like it's a book that i'm reading right now and i feel like right. you know after going through your um after going through some of your content and then also reading about your story of like kind of how you came to this it's called the will to change by bell hooks Oh no! Uh uh. Yo, this is gonna this is gonna blow your hair back. Wow. Yeah, dude, I'll definitely check it. I just wrote it down. Yeah, That's I'm I'm about halfway through it right now, but it's okay. um it's all about how men are socialized, how is how the little boy experience to the man experience, how we're taught to repress our emotions, how the only emotion we're allowed to show is anger, like all that. Um. So yeah, man, it's I think you'll really dig it. Um. And, um, and I appreciate it. Even just out of what I've heard, like you brought up disc, um, you know, and, and another personal profile I've been heard of, I'm a huge fan of like all the assessments I've done disc, I've done Myers Briggs, I've done my Enneagram. Like I'm all about like, learn about yourself so that you can optimize yourself and be the best human you can. Boom. That's exactly right. Well, which is a huge part of emotional intelligence, right? It's self-awareness. Yeah. If you don't know 
how you roll in, you know, I use a military analogy sometimes too. my background's military is, yeah. so, you know, are you the, are you a 45? Are you a nine mil? Are you the AR? Are you the 240 Bravo? Are you right? Which weapon system are you? Because they all have different purposes and you use them in different scenarios. And if you don't know which weapon system you are, you could be trying to use a tank to, to kill an ant. Right. Yeah. And that's not appropriate in, in different professional and personal situations. So having that self-awareness of, how you're wired and what your what your superpowers are right is 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 so important right so, so you Hell can yeah. bring so you can bring your best to the world and, and and make the world a better place you know what i mean yeah man so, no yeah. that's great no, i'm Jeff. excited about this man i love your background it's very cool oh thank you bro appreciate that yeah this is actually <laughs> some people ask me dude why do you have a leg it looks i guess it looks like a leg it's it's actually in ranger school uh, are you have you familiar at all with the military I mean, I'm familiar with it in the terms I grew up in the United States. So like literally everyone is, and I, and I've read, uh, extreme ownership. So like, I've got the Jocko okay. willing kind of take on leadership, but, uh, outside of that, no, I, okay. I heard about what boot camp was like. And I was like, hmm, nah, it's not me. <laughs> That's right. I'm the dude to be like, I'm not doing the same more. They'd be like, you actually signed up for this and there is not a choice. And I'd be like, well, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is, it's called a swamp stump. So there's a school called Ranger School, and I call mm -hmm. it the the Army's Elite Weight Loss Program, which I need to go back through again, right? But it's it's a three month, two sixty eight day school, and the last phase is in Florida, in the swamps in Florida, and in, when you're doing your patrols in the swamps, you run into a lot of these swamp stumps, and that you have to avoid and not get, you know, kick them or trip over them or whatever, and so the in graduation you can buy a swamp stump as like a souvenir for a graduation so nice anyway. <laughs> right on man right on well it's so funny i just interviewed another guy uh last week who said great podcast hosts make the great podcast guests and i'm like dude that's a great that's yeah. a great that's a great point you know yeah. the secret formula i think any good podcast host will discover this at some point if you have an interview show the secret ingredient it's one single thing to make a great show authentic curiosity that's it. Ooh, if you're just genuinely it. curious about other people, it's going to be a good show. Yes. Love that, bro. Love it. Okay. So EQ Gangster Podcast and YouTube audience, man, I'm so stoked to introduce our super guest today, Jeff Gibber. This guy is the bee's knees, the real deal, holy field, the cat's pajamas. So <laughs> I, de I definitely got to elevate my game, man. Jeff is awesome. So formerly known as the world's most handsome social media and content marketing strategist, our guest now goes by another title, Superhero. Now, I've heard his story, so it actually does not go by today because he started with Superhero a long time ago when he was a kid. Um, but he is the author of The Lovable Leader, a strategist, a professional speaker, and the founder of several companies, including, there we go, <laughs> boom, nice, a professional, so strategist, professional speaker, the founder of several companies, including Super Productive and the Superhero Institute, which I also want to ask you more questions about. Jeff helps people to unlock their potential to grow revenues while making a positive impact on the world. Jeff is also the host of his own popular podcast called Shareable. So, and I'm going to have all his links and stuff in the show notes for those of y'all that are watching on YouTube. This guy is, is, we are like separated from birth, like twins, right? <laughs> By about 20 years, probably. And, um, and, and so I'll put all that stuff in the show notes. So if you're watching on YouTube, be able to be, a, you know, watch the episode for those on the podcast, man. Thank you for watching, subscribing, sharing, rating, reviewing. And if you dig this episode like a shovel, please share it with homies because he, I know he's going to add tremendous value after doing a lot of homework and prepping to get to know him he's got some amazing thoughts and concepts concepts for you all. okay so big jeff tell me how it all started so i watched a little bit of your of one of your well actually a lot of your presentation that you gave to another organization tell me about your childhood and how that contributed to where you're at today yeah, man. And thanks for having me on the show. I'm like super jazzed to be here because after looking you up a little bit, I was like, yo, we're going to we're going to rock. Um, so the the long story of it is that um, I grew up in a house where, you know, my dad had uh, a, an issue with authority. And I think that that came through either genetically or, you know, nature or nurture in some way. But I always just was a questioning kind of kid, had a, had trouble with authority. So that's kind of like been embedded in there. And then I grew up in the 80s, right? So we saw, you know, I saw my mom get laid off. Uh, my dad was a funeral director. So I saw him go into work early every day and like grind away so he could be home early to be able to play with me. 
And like, these were my influences growing up. And my dad, you know, who spent all of his time burying dead people said to me, like, find something you love to do. So you don't spend your life burying dead people, essentially, like, do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So I took that to heart. And granted, that was like the, the promise of the 80s, like follow your passion, right? But I actually did it. And, and after failing for like, nearly 20 years of trying it, I'm actually at a point where I get to do it. Um, so like anybody tells you to follow your passion and like you expect that like you're going to do that and it's going to click. Nah, nah. It, like even after 20 years, you may still find that it's not working, but I lucked out and I'm able to do what I love. So that's the basic story is, you know, I, I thought I was a superhero as a kid. I lost that for a long period of time. And I thought I was kind of average, kind of dumb because I have ADHD and school isn't built for people like me. And then I rediscovered it later in life. That's amazing. So, and, and I, dude, I invented ADD and ADHD. <laughs> nice. Way, I am like the OG of ADD. Squirrel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shiny red ball. Three, <laughs> That's right. And, and it's so funny because, because there is definitely, there's, I've heard two camps with that, right? Of following your passion. No, don't follow your passion, right? You, you got to do the grind. And then by doing a whole bunch of stuff, you will end up finding your, your, your passion through that way. I've heard different camps on that for sure. Um, and, and, but I have done it like you too. I have kind of followed my passion. I've been a serial entrepreneur and doors have opened. In, in fact, one of my buddies told me who I've been friends with for 20 years, he's a CEO of a company. He's like, he's like, no, but dude, it's taken you 20 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> right. And I'm like, yeah, the whole uh, Robert De Niro or whoever said that quote, I'm like, man, that's, that's so true. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you're okay. So, so your dad buried dead people. So what, so he was a coroner. What, what? No. So he, so my dad grew up in, um, you know, uh, during the Vietnam war era and like, he grew up in upstate New York. The, the, the kind of like life motto was like, you get a good union job, you get married, you have kids, you know, you retire with a pension and like the gold watch or whatever. And like that, that was like the influence. Um, and he was adopted and like, you know, he just, he, he was the type that wasn't going to go to college. So like before he was drafted, he decided to enlist so he could choose what he did. And he decided that he was going to go into like the body retrieval and like the, like, instead of doing like being in combat, he rightly said, I'll get there after the fighting stops, a higher chance of safety. Right. So he went into that. So when he came back, that's when he, you know, in the natural progression was like, well, I'll go into being a funeral director. So that's kind of how we got into it. And it was a good paying, you know, a good like union job sort of thing. So like, and, and like, he didn't really know what his passion was. I don't think, I don't think he thought it was an option. So he just was kind of like, what's a good thing that I can do. I can make a good living, provide for the family, whatever. So that's kind of how we got into that. Okay. So man, I, I've got a question that just popped up that I don't think I've asked anybody else on. And I've been doing this for a couple of years, not as long as you, but a couple of years. What issues do you feel that your parents had that affected and impacted you? So I think there's a lot of them. So, so one, there's the fact that like, I'm a child of divorce. Like my mom and my dad split when I was like maybe 10. So then I got like two, two distinctly different families. Uh, and like, obviously there was something there around like trust and relationships and like my whole view of like, what, you know, what marriage is supposed to be and what relationships are supposed to be. So there's a, there's a part there that definitely carried through for me. But I think in terms of the things that I got from each of them individually, um, I think both of them had a little bit of a, what I want to do is what I want to do sort of mentality, right? So like, even though my dad kind of went a, a safer route, didn't like follow his passion, he also really didn't take any guff from anybody. Like he wasn't good with the authority thing. So like he carved out his own thing, was good enough at what he did that he could kind of not take anything from anyone. On my mom's side, she just kept kind of chasing what she wanted to do, but she just never found any real success with it. She was just permanently unhappy chasing one idea to the next, looking for satisfaction in it. So I think what I got from that, if I, if I really analyze it, is that like my dad was happy with what he had because he had a really rough kind of upbringing. So he kind of embodied like a satisfaction with just what is, like I am who I am and this is that. And my mom had a little bit of a, I'm going to chase to try and find the thing that makes me happy. So it was almost like he started with it while she was searching for it as an endpoint. So I think I got a little bit of that out of both of them. I don't know if that was my read on it uh, or if that's actually what it was, but that's kind of what I took from it. But, but definitely both of them encouraged me in different ways. Um, and, I, and I think my dad was more universally supportive of whatever I felt like doing. Got it. Got it. You know, because something that's been fascinating for me is, and, and, and I, I, in my podcast, I share a lot about 
the, the negative consequences of, of my, uh, my parents and my, one of my, my dad's passed away 13 years ago. My mom's, she's great. She's we call her Tasmanian angel. She's runs hundred miles an hour, four for 10 little Mexican lady. Uh, and she was amazing. She, she's amazing. With that being said, there were a, a number of emotional consequences with the way that we were raised. Again, amazing parents and leave it to beaver childhood just about, but still no one leaves their childhood unscathed. And I'm just always fascinated by how our, everyone's childhoods, not Jeff and Nobles, but everyone's childhoods end up playing out in the children's lives into and throughout our lives. 100%, nice. man. You, you know, you know that, that the whole story of like the two identical twins grow up with an alcoholic father and one grows up, never touches a drink. and The other grows up to be an alcoholic. Like that whole concept of we all take something away from maybe the same scenario. Um, I, I totally believe that because I don't think any parent knows what they're doing. I know you're a parent. I'm a parent. We're always making up as we go along. And I think what a lot of I think what just about every parent probably does, and I'm, I'm extrapolating this, it, it could be wrong, but I think every parent to a certain extent looks at how their parents were and they try to say, well, I liked these things, right? Like take a block of 10 things that your parents did. You might say, well, I like these six. I'm kind of iffy on these two and these two things I'm gonna do totally different, right? Like there are certain things that my parents didn't push me on that I wish that they pushed me harder on. There's certain things that they pushed me on I wish they kind of eased off a bit. And I think that ultimately that, whether it's your parents or whether it's your friends or anything, like, Everything that happens, you're formulating some sort of an opinion about, and it's helping you to internalize and, and see your world through the lens of those experiences. Um, and I think obviously parents are, are, are such an, an enormous part of that. And I even talk in my book a lot about this, that um, so much of my philosophy on leadership comes from the different households I was in, both my, my dad and my stepmom and my mom and my stepdad, very, very different leadership cultures there. And there was a, a culture that resonated with me and one that just simply didn't. And a lot of that informed at least one component of how I think about leadership. Mm, man, that's, that's amazing. I that's mean, and awesome. think about you, right? Like you, you have a background in military. And one of the things I appreciate about listening to your show is that, you know, a lot of people who have a background in military, their conversations around leadership and communication have an undertone of dominance and control. There's a certain like hierarchy, a fall in line. And I think the fact that you're approaching from an emotional intelligence standpoint um, you know, you're, you're really bringing that EQ into the fold. It's a different perspective on a, on a concept that a lot of people use in business. We use analogies of war and conflict all the time to explain concepts in business, but you can, you can take the very same concept and approach it from just a completely different angle with the same background as somebody else. Yes, that's exactly right. And, 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 and I would argue in some cases, a much healthier perspective or angle as well right that because a lot of people I, I know you, you know that there are there are a lot of there are a lot of emotionally dysfunctional people in leadership yes. and, and a lot of times I say this a lot of times too is that the reason why so many successful people are successful is because of some sort of emotional dysfunction right trying to prove their worth their value trying to please my my uncle, my dad, my grandpa, you know, whatever, right? Fill in the, fill in the story. Um, and so, okay, that's, no, that's great. That's great, Jeff. And, and for the audience, I just want you guys to, you know, as, as I'm asking Jeff these questions and we're talking here, pay attention to the, and no, no pun intended here with the season that we're just going to go through is that the emotional intelligence Easter eggs that Jeff is talking about throughout what he's sharing. It may not, he may not, or I may not say eat emotional intelligence, but a, it's, I've been fascinated the last few four years that I've been in this space, how much of life is tied to emotional intelligence and emotional health. How did you get emotionally healthy or emotionally intelligent? What, what did that journey look like for you? I mean, I, I think I have to credit at least a portion of it to just pure luck of the circumstance being born into the experiences I had. There's a certain like material quality to everyone's experience where the people that you have the, the privilege and the good fortune to interact with, uh, you know, they present you with certain opportunities to make choices that are, you know, emotionally healthy versus not. So I, I do have to at least chalk part of it up to luck. Like I, I was born into a situation where I had a number of different privileges I had a number of different people that I was lucky enough to interact with. So, and, and then part of it, I have to give just a little sliver of, 
I just happen to make the right choice in certain circumstances to listen to certain people and not others. Whereas, you know, there's definitely times where I screwed that up and I listened to the wrong people and I developed some bad habits that I've had to, to work through. So I, I think there's a part that's there. I do think that the, the crux of your question, though, comes down to a willingness to self-examine. And I think part of that from like the, the you know, you, you watched my talk on becoming superhuman, you know, as a child who wanted to become a superhero, I knew that as a superhero, as somebody who wanted to be a superhero, I had to constantly work and grow and become better. And you can't become better if you think you're already at the apex of where you should be. So as a human, I see myself as 100% perfectly incomplete in that I am never going to stop growing. I am never going to think that I have it fully figured out. Even my most deeply held belief, and people know me to be very opinionated about certain things, uh, especially as it relates to like kindness and compassion in the world. Like I'm very, very rigid about it, but I'm still willing to hear people. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a willingness to question yourself and your values and your beliefs about things in service of becoming the type of person you want to be. So I think I set a stake in the ground of like, I want to be a superhero, right? I want to be a person who cares for others. I want to be a person who makes others feel seen. I never want to make someone feel badly about themselves. I want to protect people who can't protect themselves. Like all of these things that like I idealize, right? Whether it's through the media I consume or whatever. And I think to do those things to get there, I know that I have to work on myself. You know, you can't be, you can't be a superhero if you make people feel uncomfortable in your presence. You can't be a superhero if you make people feel, um, you know, not just uncomfortable, but like that they don't have a voice to speak in your presence. So there's just a lot of things. I think you just have to, you have to be willing to question yourself and work on it. Okay. So fire, that is fire, bro. I, okay. But that's also a leap that I don't know that everybody takes. I, I didn't make that leap. I didn't. So, so you went from. When I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to be a superhero, and I, I mean, I knew I was a superhero, and and th and therefore, here's the leap that you made, and therefore, I knew that I had to continue to improve and grow and evolve. I I didn't make that leap. I was yeah. like, hey, let me try jumping off this railing or whatever, and I can fly, and let me try to run real fast, and 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 I didn't make the connection between being a superhero and growth. That's that's huge, bro. How can one develop that ability to begin questioning ourselves, questioning our thought process and challenging, our, challenging ourselves and, and maybe some old stale mindsets or principles or how, how do you develop that? Yeah. So I realized I, I, I did kind of make a leap also in going from like, I was a kid here and then this happened, but like if I had to analyze like what were really the triggers along the way that caused me to stop and be like, oh, oh man, I really need to re-examine some stuff. It was times where I harmed people. It was times where, because I, I grew up, you know, nobody wants, to, everybody tries to avoid pain, right? And I grew up in, uh, through at certain parts of my life where I felt different, I felt other, I felt, you know, again, the ADHD thing, like I didn't realize this until much later in my life, but I went through a large period of like masking as if I was like quote unquote normal, right? Like that I processed the way other people did and then feeling stupid and this and like all of these things that came from that. And there were parts throughout my life where I didn't feel part of the club. Like I didn't feel like I had enough friends or I didn't feel like, you know, I could get the girl or I didn't feel like part of this group or that group. So there were all of those things where I didn't like the way that that made me feel. Right. And then there were times later in my life where I made other people feel that way. And it was in those moments, especially when it was, a, and, and I think one of the big triggers is when you realize that you're doing it completely unintentionally, right? Like, I think if I remember from your story, one of the big things that happened for you was a thing that you did not even mean to happen, but you were like, oh, wow, I am not this person. I don't want to be this person. So for me, so many of those moments throughout my life where I was like, I don't feel comfortable with how I just made somebody else feel there. I don't feel comfortable with how this reflects on who, what me doing this, who that makes me as a person right? I don't want to be the person who does that thing. So let me examine where that came from. Let me work on myself. Let me try to grow in that particular area so that I don't make that same mistake and I don't make other people feel that way. And I think, and again, I'm going to tie this back to a superhero thing again, because I think that it's, a, it, it, it really is a, almost a direct line. Injustice kills me. Like as a concept, I don't like the idea of, um, as an example, like, seeing a homeless person on the street, like destroys me in my soul. I remember when I was a kid growing up in New York, first time I went to Manhattan, I saw a homeless person for the first time. It blew my mind. It was possible. 
right? And then throughout my life, anytime I've seen anything that is an injustice, people being treated differently because of something or another, or people not having what it is they need to survive and live a life of dignity, it just crushes me inside. So anytime I confront a point where I see injustice, I think that partly triggers me. Mm, yeah. So, so it was, it was ultimately pain and discomfort that unintentional pain and discomfort that you felt that you were like, okay, snap, this is not, that, that, that was not my intended outcome or objective and, and, you know, and injustice and that kind of thing. Like, okay, I got to do something about this. A lot of people don't take ownership. How, how did you, how did you take ownership? Like, Hey, you know what? I may not be able to fix all homelessness in the world, but I'm going to fix, you know, I'm just using that as an analogy. But yeah. How did you take ownership of your, where you're at, your emotional health, your emotional intelligence, your, your goals? Your, was it easy for you to take ownership? Was it like, how was that experience? I don't think it was, I don't think I would say that it's, that it is easy, that it was easy, but I would say that where it came from was a relatively simple place. So, um, there are, there are really two things that I think were major triggers for me in my life. And I, I look at this all the time. And, um, you know, when I talk with my therapist, I, I don't know if these are healthy things or not, but, um, but I'll tell you where it came from. So I was a depressed little teenager at one point, like in my 11, 12 year old preteen sort of thing. I was very depressed. I liked girls a lot. And I just, I had like a thing. Right. And I remember just going through this depressive phase. And then I watched this movie, dead poet society. And you know, it's, it's like kind of cheesy with the whole carpe diem thing, but it really struck me at that point in my life. Cause I was having like a, a, you know, what's, what's before a quarter life crisis. Like I was too young to be having a, like, what is my life mean moment, but I was having a, like, what does my life mean? Like, what have I accomplished at 13 years old, which is way too early to have this. But I remember having this kind of epiphany of like, you only get this one life. So like, what are you going to do with it? And I think that like keen awareness, and, and maybe it's partly because my dad was a funeral director, but like the keen awareness of your mortality that like you only have so much time here. I think to myself, well, what do I want it to mean? Do I want to waste that time? So that spurs me into action. So that's, that's definitely one of the big things that has caused me to like examine that. And then the other is, you know, kind of related. I, there was a point early on in my life where I kind of just looked at things that I regretted and I said, well, a lot of times it was like the regret was from not taking an action that I should have, or the regret was from doing something that maybe I shouldn't have. And I think that clicked in me a sense of like, well, I should be more thoughtful about these things and try to avoid having those moments because I don't like the way that they feel. I don't like the feeling of not taking an advantage of an opportunity that I should have. And I don't like the, I did something thoughtlessly that I shouldn't have. And granted, I still do all this stuff all the time because humans, we suck, we're imperfect. And no matter our best intentions, we're going to mess up. But I think that the commitment to doing better and, and avoiding that regret and living each day is kind of what drives it. That's awesome. And something that's just so fascinating, hearing you process some of these experiences in, in your life is, is actually comes from one of your, let's see, meta abilities, your five meta abilities that you yeah. talked about during your, your superhero speech. And one of those, let's see, it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's the meta ability number one. And it's fascinating hearing you model your principle of learning. And, and it's, it seems like every, you know, okay, so this life experience and then this life experience and then this life, ex like every one of your life experience, and I say everyone, but uh, it sounds like many of your life experiences, you have learned how to learn the most from your life experiences like it it sounds like you you know in strengths finder i'm sure you're familiar right strengths finder mm -hmm. 2.0 and stuff a maximizer is somebody that maximizes every situation scenario as, as optimizes and it man it just sounds like you you learn so much from these different experiences that you've been through which which to to your point the superhero meta ability is i think is so is massive right if we if we don't so okay so how how can one get better at learning how to learn from our different life experiences it's a good question and and it's one of those things um to a certain extent a lot of what i do 
it's hard to explain because it's just kind of who I am and what I do, right? So like uh, you mentioned the strengths finder in my Enneagram, they, you know, when I got the report and I go through all the different things, my number one super ability is they even, I think they call it a superpower. I'm a 20 out of 20 on self-improvement. So like, why am I so committed to self-improvement, right? Well, if I had to actually be really honest about it, I think that it comes from trauma. I think that it comes from, I'm, I'm trying to make up for all of the years that I felt stupid, that I felt like I wasn't smart because I couldn't process information the same way as my classmates. And there, there's so much that I think, even though this works out to be really useful for me and it can be really healthy and it can help me grow in certain ways, I think it comes from probably a very deeply unhealthy place. And I'm not sure I would recommend that to people. So if I'm, you know, I'm examining myself, I think that it comes from a place that I'm constantly working on with my therapist around like self-worth and value and things like that. Um, but I think that you, you know, where if I'm looking at the healthy side of it, it's, it's about deciding at some point in your life who you want to be, right? Like having a very sober look at like, there's this, um, there's some calendars you can buy that show you like the average life expectancy. And like each box is like a week of your life leading up to like 90 years old or something. And it's like very, very sobering to look at like, where are you in the process? If you are lucky enough to live a happy, healthy life to 90. Right. And I think at a super early age, I was quote, lucky enough to have that kind of a vision of my life of like, how much time do you have left? And what are you going to do with it? And I think I thought a lot about who do I want to be? What's the legacy I want to leave behind? What's the work I want to do? How do I want to impact the people around me? And, you know, I decided on a lot of those things and I chase those things now to this day. And I, I can tell you, even still being clearer than most are, I still screw up royally all the time. I talk over people. I center myself in conversations I shouldn't. I do all sorts of things that I wish that I didn't. And it's part of the growth to keep working on that and to keep looking at it because and the positive side, I'm trying to be this person that shows up a certain way and that leaves behind a certain legacy and hopefully leaves an impact that ripples outward. But I'm going to screw up along the way. I've just happened to set my flag in the ground of, of who I want to be. Man, that's so powerful. What questions do you ask yourself on a regular basis? Uh, well, there's like the healthy ones and the unhealthy ones, right? Like, And, and sometimes they're the same. Um, but, I, you know, the one that I ask myself probably most often is what impact have you made? And like emphasis included, what impact have you actually made? Right? Because it, it constantly reinforces and challenges me to look at my work and not just say like, I'm out for changing the world, which everybody to a certain extent probably has a sense of like, well, I want to change the world in my vision of what I want the world to be. Right. But what am I actually doing to affect that change? What am I actually, who am I actually reaching out to? What connections am I making? What, you know, activities am I engaged in that actually will show a measurable, you know, real result that I can look at and say, like, I had a hand in that. So that's one of the ones that I ask myself all the time. Um, you know, on, on the healthy slash unhealthy side, again, is like, you know, who, who have I harmed recently? Like, how could I have been a better person to people in my life recently? You know, as a leader, I would say one of the things that I do more than anything is just constantly look for every way I've screwed up. You know, who, who did I not validate? Who did I not appreciate recently? Who have I not made feel important or feel like they matter in my world? Who is helping me be the person that I want to be, you know? So a lot of what I um, do is critique myself. And, and I try to do it in the most loving way possible. Not like if I didn't, you are bad, Jeff, but more like if you didn't, are you being the person that you want to be? And, and then I'll tell you the other one that is the flip side of the same coin. And, uh, and I'm sure that you probably have gone through this just hearing your content and thinking about how you think about yourself and your mind is um, what am I doing for me? Like what, where am I allowing myself time to just be and exist and be good enough and to relax and indulge in self-care and to be present in the moment without needing to check off another thing off my list of things to do. So that's another one that I'm constantly checking myself on. Um, and I have a number of different systems that I use to, to remind myself of these things, but those are some of the big ones. Amazing. Amazing. I, I'm so stoked, man, to go back through this episode and <laughs> take notes and stuff. What does your emotional fitness program look like? 
Um, well, one, I, I mean, and, and I cannot stress this enough, and I've mentioned it a couple of times in passing throughout this episode, but like having a therapist is like, a, and especially, and I'm not, this isn't like a, oh, pity me, you know, as a white male in this society, but like, especially as a dude, as a guy, as a man in a, you know, masculine patriarchal society that is imposing certain values on you, where you believe you have to be a certain person to measure up to what it is to be a man in this world. My therapist is like, my safe space to go to unpack all that stuff and to question those things and and really work through it. So therapy obviously is like a number one thing. I think a number two thing is allowing yourself the space, giving yourself and putting time on your calendar to give yourself space for yourself. Like I play video games. I find it very therapeutic. And I went through a lot of years of shame about playing video games. Video games are for slackers, video games, this, that. But like, yo, for my ADHD, that is scratching an itch that nothing else can scratch and it is relaxing and it is stimulating and it's wonderful. And you know what? It's my time every Tuesday night. That's my thing. Um, so those are two of the big ones. Um, and, and outside of that, I mean, I don't, I don't really, I mean, I, I, I can't discount and, and I have to always mention, but my wife is incredible. And I think having, being in a good relationship, being in a great relationship, being in a loving relationship where you are free to be who you are, I uh, can't understate that enough or can't overstate, whichever the one is, it's really important. <laughs> that's right. Super important. That's right. Well, and that's a, that's a huge point too, that you made. So, so love your, your, your emotional fitness program that you have for yourself. Number one, just the fact that it's intentional, you know, most people don't, don't even have an emotional fitness program. So one, the fact that you've got one is huge. I think it's, that's, you just, that last point you made too was, was amazing that, you know, who, who do I have to be to allow my wife and my daughter, she's 14, to be fully them? Who do I have to be? And, yeah. and, and the next question I would ask is like, who do I have to be? What, who do I have to be to create the right environment and culture in our house to bring the best out of my wife and my daughter? Yeah you know, I think are also really, really important questions. Okay, so now I want to jump into some lovable leader questions here, lovable leadership. H how does one develop because I know, you know, trust and empathy are a couple big things that you that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. How how does one develop trust? I, I So let me preface that with this five dysfunctions of a team. Yeah, Patrick, Patrick Lencioni, I've got certified as a facilitator for his his five behaviors of a cohesive team program and course. And number one on his, on his, he's got a little pyramid that he's got he's five, five behaviors of a cohesive team is trust, but it's, it's his, his nuance. And I can't wait to hear kind of your thoughts on this. His nuance is because he does a lot of corporate stuff. It's not positional based trust. Hey, Jeff, I am, I am your boss. And so you, you know, you should trust me because I am your boss. And so, so he's like, no, 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 that's positional based trust is not, is not effective. It's got to be vulnerability-based trust. Yes, and and I like that. I, I'm like, oh man, that's fire. How how does one develop trust? Yeah. So, um, another book I'm going to recommend for your readers, and and just someone who I recommend following, you know, like a disciple, is Robin Dreek, who wrote the Code of Trust. The book is an absolute master class. It, it is the it is the uh, it is what Robert Cialdini's influence is to the concept of influence. The Code of Trust is to trust. It is the, the Bible of it, in my opinion. Um, and I think one of the things that I always appreciate about that book and kind of what you just said as well, is that trust is not a tactic. Trust is not a strategic method of something. Trust is a vital and integral part of being able to create relationships that have resilience, that have strength and, and the ability to do things with, right? Like, so trust is just an essential component. It's not like a, a thing, right? But the process of building trust can be broken down and looked at and thought about in certain ways so that you can get better at doing it. And one of the things that I think is really essential is that the, the key to developing trust, one of the big keys is that it's not about you, is that it is about the other person. So if you make what you're doing about them 
and what their goals, their ambitions, whatever they're trying to do, and not what you want, you have a much better likelihood of engaging them. And ultimately, if you are authentic in helping them get what it is that they want, you develop trust, right? I think that probably goes back anthropologically to like some early ancestors of humans, like that was probably a key component of it. Um, I personally think that one of the underpinnings of trust has to be care. It is very difficult to develop trust in a non-caring relationship. And by care, I just mean a general uh, awareness of and interest in the other person's well-being, uh, a sense of respect and kindness in how you interact with them. I think if you have that as an underpinning, the care as an underpinning, you kind of create fertile soil for trust to grow. And if you make care kind of your North Star in how you interact with people, it's very likely that you're going to develop trust. Okay, awesome. Help me better understand. So I, I do executive coaching. We do a lot of yep. leadership coaching and stuff. And with an with emphasis on emotional intelligence, there are a number of leaders in senior, senior leaders in companies and organizations that can be very transactional. So yes. you mentioned a number of words that if I put my transactional leader hat on, don't, I don't care about. So yeah. So, hey, trust is not a is not a technique. It's well, it is for me as a transactional guy. I just want you to perform better. So for me, how do I use this tool called trust to insert in the little slot, and all of a sudden you're going to start performing better. The second thing is, care is also for a transactional guy. It's it's hard. Like, I, I how do I sink my teeth into care? Like, just start caring for somebody. What? Well, that's very. How do you know what I'm saying? Like, how do I sink my teeth into how do I help a transactional person learn what you just shared or, or embrace or, or assimilate what you just talked about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of like a, a you kind of have to almost Trojan horse this because the, what they want is results. Right. And, and this is really my whole book is written in a lot of ways as sort of a counterbalance to this. Right. Like leadership has been about like, we have a destination and we're going to get there. And nah, it's very transactional and very like, we're a team until we get to the thing. And, but you're all like, we're all part of a machine that gets to this. So like that never resonated with me. And I think the way that I've tried to approach it with people who have that mindset is to express to them that this is still going to be a more effective way to get where you're trying to go. So like, whether you believe in care or any of that touchy feel good Pollyanna of like, you could actually care and build trust and safety and psychological safety. And like, you could build all of these things in your, in your organization. And here's the thing, it's actually going to help you get better results. So why not just lean into it? That's sort of like my, my Trojan horse way of getting into it. Now, if I have to, I will, I will take them at face value and say, okay, you don't care about it all. So I'm going to teach you the ways in which to do it, but here's my ask for you. Every once in a while, just entertain the authentic emotion of trying to care about the person you're doing this with. Like, there are some people who really will just put up that defense and there's reasons why they do it. Like they were conditioned like that. Nobody wakes up and says, I don't care about other people. You were raised or, or you were educated and cultivated in an environment that taught you not to care about people. Great, that's horrible. I feel badly for you, but like, it's not an irreversible condition. You just have to rediscover your empathy. You have to rediscover that other people are actually people, right? And I think one of the ways you do it with people that are transactional is to extend to them that empathy and care and trust and smile and do all the things that builds connection with them so that they start to feel how, how good it feels. And you say, now let's be honest, wouldn't you rather work with someone like me who actually cares about helping you get where you're trying to go than somebody who's just going to treat you like a number that I'm just going to take your money and maybe help you get your result? I want long-term. I want to help you get there, not just now, but I want to help you get there in the future. So I'll teach them the tactics of it. I've got an extremely tactical framework in the book for trust. And I'll teach it on this show if you'd like, but it's, it's a six-step framework for how to build trust in a conversation. And it is absolutely fire. You will love it. It is foolproof. It's amazing. But here's the thing. If you start to use it as a tactic for too long, people are going to see right through your nonsense. It's sort of like, you know, the compliment sandwich. You know, that whole right, technique sure. of like, oh, I'll say something good, then I'll say something critical, right. and then I'll say something nice. Like once that became a tactic, people see right through it. But right. if you are the person who genuinely cares about that person and you're like, hey, I'm going to tell you some things I really like about what you did. I'm going to tell you some things I, I, I think could be improved, but I want you to know, like, I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. I'm going to help you get there. So here, I'm going to give you the compliment sandwich because I want to start with the good stuff because I really do want to call it out, but I'm going to tell you something I'm critical of. Like if you took that approach as opposed to like, well, you were very good in that meeting and spoke up. 
I also hate the way how you don't hit your sales numbers at all. And if you, you know what I mean? Like that's not going to work. That's right. So you can do things that are tactical without it being tactical. Yeah. Excellent. Love that. Love that. And, and another thing that I found helpful is one of the things I'll do is I'll ask them. So what, what has, what have been, tell me your top one or two leaders you've ever worked for. What are the top, the bottom two leaders you've ever worked for? And, and tell me about both of them. And inevitably, the worst ones fall into the camp. Well, they, they just didn't care. Okay, well, how, how did that feel? What was that experience like, right? It's like, okay, so, <laughs> right? But yeah. what you're right is that that comes from somewhere. And, and you're right, because the, the folks that I'm going through that, that I've been coaching for a while that are transactional, like you said, there's, I call it the emotional origin story. There's, a, there's an origin story of, of that, you know, abandonment like I, okay i got abandoned when i was a kid okay well screw everybody i'm not going to care i'm not going to care about anybody because yep. i got to protect myself right so so there's an emotional origin source so finding and discovering that emotional origin source. okay so kind of wrapping up here tell us about your book tell us about your book tell us about your your programs what is going on right now what's hot and heavy in jeff's life right now yeah, man. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, what my friend Robbie Samuels would call a multi comma. So like, I just do so many different things, man. Like I'm a consultant, I'm a coach, I'm a speaker, I'm a trainer. I've got a multitude of different businesses that I do in partnerships. Um, and I've got this book and, and it's the most proud I've been of anything. And I don't know about you, if you do this, but like, I look back at everything I've ever done and I'm like, ah, it's, it's crap and I could do better. Right. But my book is like one of the few things that like, I still, for as long as it's been out, it's been out since January 20, uh, 25th. Um, it's one, and it took me five years to write. It's one of the things that I'm still genuinely legitimately proud of. And I feel like it, of all of my work, it's probably the thing that I feel best contributes to the legacy of like who I want to be in this world. So the lovable leader was a concept that came to me on a car ride with my wife who had just started managing people. She was asking me about like, you know, different things that she was dealing with and like being a leader for her people. And I was giving her advice. And my wife is just super lovable. Like as a human, she's just like the embodiment of like a lovable person. She's very sweet, very Disney princess. Like, so the, the, the title of the book just came to me. And what I wanted to write about was the type of place where realistically it's an environment that I could work in. Cause I am an entrepreneur and I can't, I'm psychologically unemployable. So I wrote a book for like, how can you create an environment where even the worst possible employee, which me like legit, I'm terrible. Um, that I could work there. And what does it come down to? It's a place where people have the freedom to grow. It's the place where they feel supported. It's the place, place where they feel trusted. It's the place where they feel like the people that they're working for care about them and they show it. I mean, I even got a, a part of the book about how to fire someone. And it's not like just like deuces, you're out, you weren't a good fit. But like legitimately, if you care enough about someone to hire them, you should care enough about how to let them go properly, helping them find the next spot, writing recommendations for them just because it wasn't a good fit doesn't mean you have to harm this person on the way out. So the whole book is about how to build your team with trust, respect, and kindness. And the whole thing is built on three pillars, care, trust, and safe travels. And safe travels, let me break down, is the creation of psychological and physical safety on the way towards a goal. I liken it to like a plane, right? It's not just enough to get to your destination, which is what most leadership's books are about. It's like, how are we going to get from New York to Los Angeles? Well, you can get in the plane and go, but if those doors open at 30,000 feet, it's not particularly safe. So you got to make sure and ensure that there's safety on the way of the destination. So the whole book is written with those three pillars, and it is written specifically for new managers, because I feel like that's the future. You know, it's like the children are our future. New managers are our future because they can change the culture of work in the way that entrenched, established, transactional CEOs cannot. So that's why I wrote the book for. It's why I wrote the book. And my hope is to create more cultures where people feel safe to bring their best selves to work and they can go home feeling like they're complete. Wow. Bro, I cannot wait to get a copy of that book, man. I'm definitely down like four flat tires, bro. That sounds nice. amazing. So how do we follow you? How do we find you? How do we get involved in what you're doing? Tell yeah, us man. We- so one of the, uh, one of the, uh, challenges of being a multi comma is that I could sit here and I could list off like 15 websites. I mean, I do this here. I do this here. I do this here, but I actually made it really simple. Uh, I found this really cool platform recently called card C A R R. I think there's a third R maybe it's two R C A R R D dot C O anyway, it's amazing. And what I, it's sort of like link tree in the sense that like I created a page that essentially links 
to everything. And I've categorized information architecture beautiful. So if you just go to jgibber.com, you can connect me on social. You can find my content. You can find my products. You can find my speaking stuff. You can find you know, my blog, which I highly encourage everyone to read, uh, my podcast. So like you could go there and you could just decide, I'm just going to follow them on Twitter or I'm going to dip out. You could go there and you could buy my book. You could listen to my podcast. You get, so it's all right there. Jgibber.com makes it easy. One destination, one website, no list. Bro, you rock like ZZ Top, man. I cannot thank you enough for your insights, your wisdom. Your, and also, dude, <laughs> oh my gosh. If you're watching on YouTube, y'all got to see this episode on YouTube. He is off the charts. So so thank you, bro. And, and, and listen, the other thing I want to thank you for is thank you for the work, not only that you have done personally, to to create and put out the content that you're putting out to make the world a better place the mental emotional spiritual physical whatever all the work that you've done uh is man i appreciate that thank you thank you for the years that you invested in in all these questions that you're asking yourself and growing and discovering how you know your your superpowers and how god made you so that so that i could i could get the you know, Jeff that I got today, man, because it you there's an awesome verse I love in the Bible. It's Proverbs 27, 17. It's iron sharpens iron. So big Jeff Gibbard sharpen big poppy. So thank nice. you, brother. That was, I, I thought I read that. I was so familiar. I think I have that tattooed right now. Not, not <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Thank you, bro. Totally appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely.